Charles Williams, seller master, winemaker of the turn. What's your title? Seller master. Seller master. Yeah. Sheesh, man. When I first met <laughs> no, you, yeah. I think you were like the third in command junior winemaker. Yeah. Basically, the guy that cleaned the floors, um, took pipes from point A to point B. So, yeah, um, life has been good to me. <laughs> Ama amazing. Well done. I think, you know, I'm super excited about today because uh, today we are under the influence of blends, of red blends in particular. And tomorrow you will be finalizing your blend for the Deterrent Fusion 5, which was one of my aha moments in wine where it just it suddenly became this obsession when I tasted the first vintage of Fusion 5. Should we dive into this? I mean, you know, what, what makes a great blend? It's, it's pretty much putting all the leftovers together, right? Exactly. <laughs> or not exactly. No. Um, Alistair, yeah, it's, thanks, for, first of all, for having me. Um, blending is such a, such an exciting part. I think it's kind of the highlight of our calendar, if you want. Um, and a lot of the time, people do think that blending is just putting a lot of wine together and magically uh, a superior product appears. Um, the great thing about blending is it actually starts two years back and it all starts in the vineyards. Yeah. Um, Especially so, at Deterrent. I mean, your, your, your blocks are planted as blends. Very much so. So uh, again, and, and that's actually how Deterrent started. It was because of the diversity of our soils. So when we initially did a, a scan or a detailed search of our soils, we found 15 different soil types in there. Wow. So you're going from like really rich soils to really poor soils and what that meant for us, if we were to go and plant a single variety, so whether it was Sauvignon Blanc or Chenin Blanc or Cabernet Sauvignon, we would get areas that really suit that variety and you'd get areas that really did not suit that um, variety. And what we figured out was that when we looked at all the different soil types and what varieties would actually suit them, one of the five Bordeaux varieties, red Bordeaux varieties, suit one of those spots. Brilliant. So it actually started 20 years ago with a lot of planning and we call it perfection by design. It wasn't that we just threw vines at the, the soils and something magical happened. It was actually a lot of analysis and a, and a lot of thought that went into planting the vines on each specific spot. The different clones, the different rootstock options, the different spacings, all of that went into that bigger picture of then creating a blend, which was at that stage only the Fusion 5. Um, today we've got a few more blends, but um, that is still the one carrying the flag for us. Amazing. So I think a good place to start is let's dive into the components of the Fusion 5. We, so we, it's a Bordeaux uh, blend, five varietal, Cabernet Sauvignon driven, mm -hmm. Merlot, Cabernet Franc, Malbec, Petit Verdot. If, you, if we can dive into this, not only because it's a uh, Monday afternoon and there's no better time to enjoy some wine, but I'd love to understand what each grape varietal brings to a blend like the fusion. Okay, I think before we go that, let's okay. just maybe talk about wine and its personalities. I think that's very important. And when you look at a, a brand perspective, I think always if a wine is made from a specific property, throughout the vintages, you're always gonna get that DNA, that silver thread or that golden thread that runs through your wine. So you always wanna have that in your wine. And I'm gonna explain it in a very unromantic way now. So <laughs> if, if you're a co-guy, and you open up a bottle of Coke. You want to taste Coke. You don't want to have Pepsi in there. So I think you always want to, in your wines, when you're crafting them and blending them, create that very specific style that's very true to what your property allows you to do. So whiskey guys understand that, that you know, that when you, when you have a Johnny Walker Black, it, it needs to have that it golden thread that. that, yeah. But no, we're making wine. So yeah. you also don't want to have every vintage taste exactly the same. True. Um, and that's where the vintage comes in. So no two vintages are exactly the same. So before we start blending, we always ask ourselves the question in hindsight, the vintage is now completed, it's been in barrel for, for a year already. How do we express that vintage? So if you've had a really hot summer, you want to kind of express that little bit more robustness in the wine. If you've had a really cold, elegant vintage, you want to express that more aromatic part of your wine. So that's always the first thing that we kind of just jot down on a little paper, just put it up a little sticky note and say, okay, whenever we're crafting a wine, we want to display the vintage as well. Um, that's very important. You don't want to lose that. Um, and that's what's going to 
for the for the people that follows your brand going to make the brand and the the wine the label interesting over time is following how you can tell a kind of tell that story mm. through the vintages through gotcha. your wine and so this vintage is 2020 2020 and and 2020 from a, from a climatic perspective what was that okay so um maybe let's the, go from the personality yeah i actually want to talk a little bit about three vintages now to just give you a yeah. little bit of contrast so 2019 is probably in my 14 years of making wine the coldest vintage we've had wow. um people in the wine industry were talking about not ripening their grapes not having enough sunlight not having enough temperature and that's something that doesn't happen in south africa that's the one thing we never complain about is the amount of sunlight so i think 2019 really highlighted superior vintages yeah. it was quite a difficult vintage if you look in the broad spectrum of, of south africa and that vintage you wanted to highlight the the aromatic part of the wine yeah we kind of from the beginning said this wine is going to be medium full it's not going to be the big full-bodied wine that we normally make um and we're not going to even try and make it that way we're going to try and express the vintage and the wine turned out to be uh, probably one of the best i've ever wow. been involved with so that's the one that we've just released now 2020 was the year after that so the opposite it was a nice moderate vintage it was i always think when nature is bountiful that's when everything happens so it was quite big in volumes it was big in everything it was big in structure it Tannin was big in flavor. aromatics it's yeah. big in flavor i remember when we actually blend this so one year ago exactly one year ago um, i had the the first primary setting for us where we started tasting the different blends which i'll explain a little bit later on how we make them and walking down the corridor you could just smell the wine it was a, such an unbelievable um, experience and it's something that i still remember today clearly exactly where i walked in that corridor probably still 20 meters away from the actual tasting wow. and you could just sense the wine um, so 2020 is a very special vintage and then we go to 2021 which we're going to finalize tomorrow which is kind of in between those two vintages um, it's a vintage that's not expressing itself aromatically as brilliantly as 2019. It's not necessarily got the fullness, the richness of the 2020. But what makes 2021 special and what gets me really excited, the moment we started blending with it, the, the answer is bigger than the sum of the parts. And that's what we uh, really want from, yeah. from a blend, wine and, yeah. and blending. Yeah is where you probably have a wine that's not as strong in this component it's not as strong in this component but the moment you start making that mix and you start finding the synergies the whole is really really brilliant hmm. and that's what we're trying to create here so um yeah let's start diving into this and see how we actually go about blending these right uh, so i assume cabernet is the backbone so you'd probably start with that as the main most definitely focus. so we craft a few wines at the Turin. Um, the bread and butter of the Turin, of course, is the Fusion 5, yeah. which is a left Bordeaux blank, um, left bank Bordeaux styled wine. So dominated by Cabernet Sauvignon, it's got Merlot, Malbec, Cabernet Franc and Petit Verdot in there. And that is made specifically from a west facing slope. So yeah. here we're trying to express a little bit more power, roundness, warmthness, um, basically a feeling that we're trying to convey. And then we've also got the Deturin Z, which is a right bank Bordeaux style More wine. South facing. South facing, Merlot, Cap Franc dominant. Um, but for this discussion, we're going to focus on the Fusion 5 Perfect. and how we go about blending that specific one. Mm. Okay, so first of all, we've got Cab Sauv here. Yeah. West facing slope. So you're looking for that dark fruit, you're looking for that pencil shaving, kind of like from the oak. Yeah. And what we've actually found with this wine. Um, as it's matured in age, uh, first probably 10 years of its life, it expressed itself much more darker. Mm. And now it's going a little bit more towards that red cherries. Mm. Um, Lots of red fruit coming through your hand. From it. And we're also evolving with it. So we're not trying to, when we're making the wine, we're actually going for the more red fruit these yeah. days. Because that's what the block wants to give yeah. us. Um, so it does evolve over time as well. But I think that is also quite characteristic of that polka dry area, exactly. you know, that aspect that you've got. It's not as warm as, as the Helderberg. Uh, it doesn't give like that beastly um, sort of dark fruit, um, heavy exactly. tannin, which I love from that, from that slope. But this is a little bit more on the elegant side of things. All right. So what we've got here, this is going to be normally it's around about anything from 52 to around about 60%. Okay. 
of the blend. So it's quite firm, like you mentioned, the aromatics here is, is, is nice fresh, red fruit, there's some black fruit in there. Um, the tannins is nice and chalky. Mm. Um, it's got that nice, I almost want to call it a little bit of dryness to it, um, that kind of gets you salivating a little bit. Mm. So, and that's the backbone. So let's that's going to be the backbone. Let's fly through these. So that's the cab. You can chuck yours in here. All right. Chuck this in here. Mm. So I'm going to start our blend off as well, um, knowing how much we're normally going to play. Okay. And so put we in here. Got you. Let's try and go for around about. I'm going to multiply everything by two. So let's put about fifty-five percent cab solve in here. I think that's going to give us a solid, Perfect. solid um, backbone to start off with, and then uh, I'm going to need your feedback as well okay. um, as we're going along. Yeah, yeah. So the next variety that we're going to take is Merlot. Perfect. Um, Should I pour myself? Yes, I'll pour for both of us. Go for it. Now the Merlot in in this instance is going to one, if if the caps of is a skeleton, this is going to be the flesh. Okay. It's going to fill in all the nooks and crannies. It's going to create a lot of, of volume for us. Now, normally, when we talk Merlot in South Africa, we oh, I think a lot of places, New World places, you kind of got that blending style wine in your mind where it's a thin wine yeah. and it's it's just flavor and, and that's it. I think Merlot from Superior Sites is the opposite. It's If you think about Pomerol, um, Right Bank Bordeaux, it's wines that has a lot of density to it. Yeah. And I think that's what we find in our Merlot as well. So a lot of that purple fruit, you can just smell, this is quite a viscous wine. Wow. Such a fine tannin. It's actually super opulent on the palate here. Yeah, so that's why mm. I say this is the one that's going to be the the muscles, the body of the wine, actually. It's the one that's going to fill in everything for us. Um, after this, you start adding the wow factors. Yeah. But these two wines is what's going to form the basis of your wine. So if you get it right, then everything that happens after that becomes a synergy yes. on top of it. Roast lamb and gravy. Now we're going to add exactly. the Exactly. <laughs> if you get it wrong, yeah. then you're going to suffer throughout. You're going, yeah. to, you're going to add a little bit more of this, then this is not going to work with this. Um, but if you get that solid foundation right, around about 70% of your blend is fixed. Beautiful. And then you just start adding the layers. It's got, a, it's got this interesting characteristic, which is for me like slightly fain bossy. It's, it's herbaceousness, but not there's no greenness. It's got this, I, I don't know what you would, how I you would. I would kind of like call it, I think fain boss is a good descriptor. Mm. A little bit herbal. Like, like robust. It's, it's like that interesting red fruits, but that slight herbaceousness, which I absolutely love. I think on, if you, for instance, look at the palette here, it's, it's, I think you mentioned the word, it's a little bit more opulent mm. almost than the cab. Um, so if you put the, the little bit more linearity of the cab, the tannins that was a little bit more rougher, and you add this to it, you're adding to the, to the, to the wine in terms of structure, but yeah. also you're making it nice and fine. Yeah. Um, you just kind of what do you can call it? Um, just basically shaving off that rough edges. Yeah. So now you end up with a wine, a core, that's powerful, yet it's very elegant. And that's why Cab and Merlot work so well together, exactly. right? Um, I think that's why if you think Bordeaux blend, yeah. probably 95% of the world's Bordeaux blend is just those two varieties. And it's, and it's not just flavor combinations, but it's mouthfeel. You know? And I think that's the great thing about that Cab and Merlot work so well together is you've got that sort of fu like quite big, cab tannin mm. with that more rounder filled out yeah. uh, softer merlot and that and then the flavor combination is yeah this is amazing yeah. what a, a good way i think of explaining this is it adds without it. adding tannin it's adding density mm. to the wine um which is very important this was also one of my uh, sort of early wow moments um just just tasting your individual varietals out of out of uh, yeah. out of barrel, and seeing how it all came together. So, so I think also a... worth mentioning is when we go about making cabernet. Yeah, we're not trying to make the best cabernet in Stellenbosch. We're making a cabernet 
that's the best for our blend. Perfect. And that's very important because a lot of the times when we taste our barrel samples, and especially when you're a little bit younger, you want to compare yourself to the best cabinet in South Africa or the best cabinet in Napa. Um, but you soon realize that that's not necessarily the best cabinet for your blend. Because that would, that would create a domineering exactly. sort of blend. Yeah. So with blending, we're trying to combine all these person personalities. And if you've got one like cabinet that's really, really dominant, you're actually going to overpower the whole blend. Gotcha. Um, so that's also important. And that comes from the way that we plant the vineyard to the way that we grow it, to the way that we vinify it. So some components that we've got will match and rival the best cabinets in the world. But most of them probably won't. Gotcha. Because um, we're making them for a very specific And goal. it wasn't designed like that. Okay. So now we start going into the, spice. the ones that's really exciting to, to taste. Wait, we, you've got to gotta add your oh, Merlot. Yes. So what do you think? Um, so I think it needs a significant uh, dollop because it's, it needs to fill out um, the cab. So maybe 30% or so. I don't know. What do you, what is the I'd normal? go a little bit lower. So let's try lower. something like 20%. Done. Um, I think that takes us about to 75%. Oh, already, oh, you're right. Yeah, we've already got 55 in there. Okay, so that's 10 and another bit. <laughs> Mad scientist. All right. Now we're going to go straight over to probably one of the most exciting varieties to blend with, okay. um, which is Malbec. Malbec, okay. So This is certainly one of the most standout individual wines that I've tasted from, from Deterrent. If you were to bottle something, <laughs> it's, it's yeah, uh, just by itself. This is the one that's the highest in demand. Once people have tasted the Malbec, yeah. they always ask us, why, yeah, yeah, why yeah. are you not smart enough to realize you've got to bottle that on its own? Oh, my word. Um, it's got so much depth on the nose, hey? So we've got a little trick here. There's a, a few things happening with the Malbec. Yeah. So Malbec, first of all, it's not a very well-known or popular variety in Bordeaux itself anymore. I think climate is just a little bit too cold for it in that area. Then it's hugely successful, of course, in, in Argentina. Yeah. Um, so Malbec loves big day-night shifts in terms of temperature. Um, and that's something that we find in, in summertime, we can go up to about 30 degrees or just over in the, in the morning, or in the, the days. But during the night, it goes down to about 15 yeah. or just below that. Um, so Malbec, first of all, loves that. Malbec, you've got to be extremely precise on picking it. It's the one variety where I always say, if you're wondering whether you should pick or not, pick it a little bit earlier. Oh, really? Malbec it is the one where freshness. I actually say, if you're worrying about picking it a little bit, too fresh or perfect, rather wait one or two days. Um, it's one of those varieties that in my capacity, I don't believe it wants to be unripe. Mm. If, you, if you miss the picking date by one or two days too early, it gets this really unpleasant mulberry, like unripe mulberry flavor. The tannin structures, it's, 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 it's not that nice creaminess that you normally get from it. So Malbec, you've got to get either perfect in terms of picking it on the right day, or rather pick it one day later or two oh, okay. days later. So it's, it's better to, to yeah. wait a little bit. We, with Cabernet, Merlot, the, all the rest of the varieties, I would actually err on saying one or two days earlier. Mm -hmm. This is the one where I always say, it's a pretty easy decision because you wait till it's perfectly ripe and the next day you pick it or the day after that. Then you but know that you're also in is beneficial for you as a location because it is a slightly cooler. So you've of got course, a little yeah. bit more scope it to is. wait a few days. Yeah, definitely. Um, Malbec on its own, it gives you a lot of Red fruit, purple mm. fruit is mm. where, where it's really dominant. Um, it's very plummy, this hair. Yeah. It gives you, and this is very, we initially thought it was a lot to do with the wood regime that we put on it, but it gives you this vanilla slash coconutty flavor. It's like um, a desiccated coconut. So <laughs> that is something that if you use it carefully, it can create the X factor. And that is, in my opinion, what creates the X factor in, in Fusion 5. That creaminess that comes through. Yeah. So what we do here is we actually use American oak, mm -hmm. but the American oak on the sides, it's American oak, but the top, the oak. bottom and the lid, basically, that's French oak. Okay. So the heads are French and then the exactly. staves are American. Um, initially, we did use full American oak paddles, but we found it enhanced that coconutty flavor just a little bit too yeah. much. So yeah. we pulled it back. Um, these barrels from the same supplier is just with, with really quality 
um, French oak heads, mm -hmm. um, which just basically reduces that effect by mm -hmm. around about 20%. So now you end up with a, a wine that's extremely um, aromatic. Yeah. It's got a huge aromatic potential to it. And when you taste it, it's, it's nice, it's viscous, it's got that nice um, mineral tannins, mm. if you want. Mm. And that's what's going to be the spice Cause that's going to light this up. Because the interesting thing for me about the, um, the cab is it had that kind of red fruit coming through the Merlot, also um, slightly more sweeter red fruit for me. But then this is the savory element mm. uh, so far in the blend, more savory. I mean, there's a savory thread that comes through in all your wines, but this has got a, a, a quite a quite a big sort of savory flavor profile. Hey? So this is always the way I describe Malbec, and to a certain degree, Petit Verdot. It's your redhead cousin. So we all have one in the family. You've got to invite him to the party. To the wedding. And he's such an awesome guy to have there. So you give him a beer as straight as he gets there because he's the guy that's going to get all the guys that doesn't know each other, he's going to get them all talking. Um, so you give him a second beer and the party becomes even better. Third beer, the party becomes even better. But by the time you give him his fourth beer, then he's taking over the party. Okay. He's um, jumping off the roof. He's doing Into that type pool. of things. So that's how I always describe Malbec. Okay. If so you get it at just the right amount in your blend, it's the one that just elevates it to the next level. But get too much of it in there, and it will definitely start dominating your yeah. blend. So that's just the one that's going to, I think that's what creates the X factor. But it just, just be an X factor. It doesn't be something that you can pinpoint and gotcha. say that's Malbec. So what do you reckon? So we're okay. on 75% now. Yeah, so I'm not going to go too big on it. This one is, is really nice and aromatic. Um, I think also the quality components of the Cab and the, and the Merlot is so good mm. that we want to kind of play on that. So okay. this is just going to add spice. I think let's go for something like 14, 15 okay, percent sure. um, total. Just uh, okay. And right. I'm going to go a little bit lower actually. I'm going to go 12 and a half percent. Okay. And then we'll taste the cab franc. And based on what we're going to do with the cab franc, we'll kind of revise where we have to be at with the, with the Malbec. Got you. Normally, Malbec and cab franc, those are the two that kind of have to play together. Got you. This is Cab Franc, okay? Okay, so my favorite variety in the Bordeaux lineup. It's, so. also, it's also one of the most incredible varieties in your particular area. Whoopsie, not pouring very well today. Oh wow, this is... Wow, it's got so much subtle spice. Like okay. red, red pepper. So, um, I'll be actually the, the CEO of the tour, and he's got this really nice analogy. So, I'm going to use his analogy and going to make as if it's mine. Hmm. So, the way that he describes Cape Franc, it's, hmm. it's um, putting on your cologne just before you go out the door. So, a lot of time you walk past a stranger and you can see their um, physical form and you find something maybe attractive about them. and and you walk past them and you just smell them and you just, that's the thing that makes you go and look around and like, hey, can I have your number? <laughs> um, that's what Cape Franc does. It's, it's the perfume of the it blend. It really is perfume there. Eh? Um, this is the one that if the previous three components are quite big or structured, this is the one that's just going to add in the elegance mm. and restrain a little bit in mm. all fairness. So this specific one, I, I must say, I've always loved this and a year in the bottle, it's it really is showing beautifully. And this is what's amazing to me about, about Bordeaux blends because there are many ways to look at it. I mean, the, one of the early kind of explanations that, that made sense to me is that it's, it was old-fashioned crop insurance, right? You've got five varietals that all grow in that area. And if you have all five on your property, then you kind of protected from different seasonal yeah. effects. You know, you've yes, got your does. late ripeners, your early ripeners, your in-between. But then the flavor and structure input that they give it, it it's just it's just so different yet there's the golden oh. thread you know they've, they've got the same roots they've got the same heritage same region so this is the one where i personally have to kind of always restrain myself a little bit uh, from not adding too much um i'm a huge fan of cap franc but cap franc is probably the most difficult one to find the synergy um in too much 
it actually has got a slight antagonistical effect on the, the complete blend. Um, although this one, I would describe it as like medium bodied, medium to full bodied. But if I were to go and now add 20% in our blend here, it's going to make this whole blend a lot thinner really? than what it should be. So it's very important to remember that the goal for us with Cab Franc in this blend, which is led by Cabernet and, and Merlot, should be the one that's just going to freshen it up, going to create the elegance, going to add the perfume. The perfume. Got so, um, so Cab, backbone. Yes. Merlot. That's going to give you the body, the, the flesh, yeah. the viscous part of it. Uh, the Malbec. That for me is the spice, the X factor, Got the you. one that kind of livens those two up. Yeah, and, and also a juiciness, which I always love in, yeah. in Malbec. And then Cabernet Franc, perfume. Perfume. So if we were to go and taste this at the moment as it is now, it's going to be probably a little bit bigger than what you would expect it, having tasted the three individual okay. components. So now we've just got to restrain it slightly. So um, I think in retrospect, we probably have to go a little bit heavier on the Malbec. And with the Cap Franc, I, I'd be in a, the region of around about 10%. Do it. Um, Let's do 10%. And I must say, um, again, this is my favorite, so I want to put 30% <laughs> in there, but I know I don't have to. Uh, you're lucky, though. You can sneak into the cellar and grab a I'll just drink the rest of the bottle on Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Okay, so let's do this. And then I'm going to go back to the Malbec. We did 12.5%, so let's add another 2.5%. Two and two and yeah. That's leaving us about 3 or 4% or 5% for 5 the for the Pinot Pinot. Pinot. Which I, I, I remember why. We'll taste that now. Charles, this one's a bit too good to turf out. So cheers. cheers to you. I agree 100%. So Fantastic. Well done. Wow, delicious. Makes me excited to go into the blend as well. Yeah. And that's also another thing. I've just tasted it again. Um, what Cap Franks also does, although analytically, it doesn't necessarily have a, a really high acidity. Okay. But it does give you a perceived acidity. It's got freshness. So you eh? just got that lot yeah. of freshness. So mm. that's also when we go to the fine tuning of these blends, and you just think that it just needs a bit of freshness, a bit of acidity, then we'll just probably add 1% or 2% more Cap Franc as opposed to adding tartaric acid. It's really interesting because I, th I think we spoke about structure and tannin and we spoke about flavor profile, but acidity is crucial exactly. uh, in the blending process, right? I think that's the one thing that um, the older the vineyards get and the older we as, as humans get and more we, or that's the way I've evolved anyways. For me these days, I'm actually just looking for that freshness and I'm all, always asking myself the question, are we making a wine that you can just like go smell, wow, amazing taste, and then you're like, wow, well, I've tasted it, I've experienced it, it's done. Two glasses would be too much. Exactly. Yeah. What we want with these wines or with our wines is when you've actually tasted it, you must be salivating afterwards. You must just go like, wow, that was really nice, intense, but refreshing. Mm. Let's go for another sip. Mm. And the more you drink it, the more amplified that kind of acidity should become and the fresh air should clean out your palate the whole time. I think that's something that we really value and that's what we're looking for as well when we, when and we it's, actually And it's also blend. interesting because I, I, I think, uh, you know, in South Africa, um, we, we don't struggle with ripeness. So, mm. so in, I think in, in France, they, they, they can add sugar, which adds more alcohol. Mm -hmm. Whereas with us, we sometimes struggle with acidity where, you know, yes. that freshness because we've got so much heat in some regions. So that acidity bank is actually a much more natural way of bringing that freshness is because, you know, some wines, if you're making more mass produced wines, you can actually adjust the acid, but oh. it's, it, it kind of brings the wine out of balance. It, it, it does. So that's why I said with everything except for the Malbec, I always now err on the side of just being a little bit earlier if, if, if it's needed. So 2022, which we've just completed, the, we've had a really hot, January, like mm. extremely hot. So when we brought in the first few varieties, we saw the acidity was down a little bit. So I actually told Martin, the winemaker, we're going to have to be at least two or three days earlier in picking than what we think. And it turned out to be exactly the right call. Because unfortunately, once you've got it into the cellar and you've lost the acidity, you can legally go and add tartaric acid if you want, but it doesn't give you that same refreshing it taste. It disconnects the wine a bit. And it yeah. disconnects it. I yeah. think that's a very good way of yeah. explaining it. Super. Okay, so now 
Okay. We, we're not left with much from a percentage perspective. But I, as I remember, your Petit Verdot and Petit Verdot in general packs a punch. Should we taste this bad boy? Yes, let's go for it. And then we see <laughs> where we are at. So we are still in our blend here. We've got around about 5% left if I've calculated correct. Yes. Oh, look at the color. First off, hey? this is such a dark. Yo. Wow. It's got like violets or something coming it's through. It's got, yeah. I think that's a very good way of explaining. So violets, purple fruit, it's got a very big density yeah. there. Um, this specific one, I think you would be able, if you construct the bend slightly different, yeah. you would have the opportunity to use actually a little bit more. You can probably go up to, to 7% if you did these two components slightly different. Mm. But this is the thing that's going to glue it all together. This is the, the necktie that you put on. Wow. Um, this is just the thing that brings everything together. And what we found in the past is at 2%, you might have no effect at all. Yeah. At 3%, it might be overpowering the blend. Yeah. So this is also one of those similar to Malbec, um, where you've got to be very precise in where it just makes everything better and where it just dominates everything. Mm. Um, so I think we're pretty much spot on in that 5%. It's also, region. it's such a credit to your winemaking uh, approach where, you know, the turn, uh, the tower, the, you know, the lack of physical maceration and pumping, it gives that softness. So even a pet, Petit Verdot, which, I mean, I've had single varietal Petit Verdots, they can just almost take the enamel. Yeah. The <laughs> it's still so soft and elegant. Um, yeah, beautiful. I must say, this is actually like, one of the Petit Verdots that's up there. Um, yeah, really the rich, coming through. really dense, um, but still very elegant. Absolutely. And it's got, again, that, that mineral tannin structure and that acidity that just actually wants you to come back for more and more. Because I'm actually also not going to decant this one. I'm yeah, this gonna... is really... Uh, these last two uh, wines are like really... Sort of, uh, well, actually, yeah, all of them. But the last, especially the Petit Verdot, it's actually really surprised me. Okay, so we're adding the last 5% in here. And then what I think we'll do is let, uh, let's have a look at this blend. Sure. So I'm going to pour out only half, and that's why yes, I kind of doubled up it. in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. So let's taste what we've constructed. Yeah. Let's give ourselves some critical feedback. Um, and then we can maybe adjust it with, with one or two of these. Perfect. Okay, so you're just doing a bit of a decanting. Nice decanting, nice blending it up. That's half of the blend in there. So similar to what I always say as work is if it's a masterful blend, I will um, very happily take all the credit. If it needs a bit of work, that's all you that wanted to have it in this way. So. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Oh, wow. I think we've done well. Let's have a squiz. Wow, that is absolutely beautiful. You see what's happened here. So I think we're very close to where you will, will be at. It's really intense. It's, it's vibrant. It's got a lot of aromatic potential to it. It's got red fruit, it's got blackberries, little hints of plum, little hints of that fine boss, that, that almost that characters you got from the Cab Franc. It's, it's interesting for me because the, the major characteristics um, which we picked up in all of the wines have just been made more subtle and, it, and they've come together and, and in that way they're amplified. It's like the ultimate blend. So if you picked up the... The, that herbaceous Feinbos character, which is very apparent, but now it's just it's just it's in the background. I think the the one leading it and it's it's nicely amplified. It it's the the cabernet. It's made that red fruit more perfumey. It's made it very prominent. The the merlot is quite obvious in here. That purple fruit against that the density. The malbec is playing a little bit of a supporting role here. I can not see the malbec as apparent. According to the amount that, that we put in it, juiciness that's coming through. Maybe that's it. I don't know. Maybe that's probably the Merlot. Um, the Cab Franc, I think you can see in there. 
and the violets, the Petit Verdot. I think we've we've done pretty well. Cheers, man. Cheers. Good um, job. We're just going. But it doesn't start stop the fire. here. So now you've made a really good blend, but now we have to ask the question: How do we make it even better? Got you. So I'm going to leave that honor up to you. So <laughs> it's quite difficult because I think we've we've got it pretty close to how good you can get it. Okay, so I think the Cab and Merlot are, are beautifully in symphony. That herbaceousness is coming through. A um, little bit of spice and perfume coming through from the Cabernet Franc. Okay, so maybe where we need to head off with this and something to keep in, in mind is the... I think the aromatic part of this is, is really sweet. It's, it's really beautiful. I think that's about as complete as you can get it. But we're also looking at the, the mouthfeel that you're getting here. And I think we can maybe have a little bit of a play on there. So, so a little bit of Petit Verdot? A little bit of freshness. That's already there. So I think the Petit Verdot is a good one because we just want to shift the palette slightly more back. Yeah. Um, cool. Let's give it a bash. All right. So now for the, for the tweaks. Okay. So... As we've been, and I think this is a sign of a great blend, is as you're twirling it around, as you're sitting with it, um, studying it, it does evolve. And yes. the wine has actually, for me, become a little bit bigger than what I initially thought. The aromatics is still nice and vibrant, but the palette has become quite dense, where I initially thought it was a little bit more medium bodied. So you had the um, idea of adding 1% more Petit Verdot, and I think that is the right direction. But the way that it's evolved, let's give ourselves an opportunity to also see if we go the other way and we make it a little, a little bit freshness, fresher. Yeah. So I'm going to take this, I'm going to divide it into two. Perfect. I'm going to add 1% Petit Verdot in the one, 1% 1 Cab Franc in the one. And then so we've got we, a freshness, we've got a, a more structure. Exactly. So then the we try and see which, which is the, the way to go. So. Okay. <laughs> a go. bad scientist. And this is a brilliant part. The more you do this, and right at the end, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a glimpse into the complexity of all of this if we take it now to a commercial yes, level. Yes. Um, okay, so Petit Verdot. <laughs> Good old wine thief. Of course, everything is done with perfect COVID regulations in place <laughs> here. So that's it. Okay, so that's the 1% that you added. Okay, that's the one there. And let's do a little bit of Cap Franc. Cap Franc for the freshness component. Sure, look at the difference in color. Yeah, uh, there's a massive difference. I see. All right, so we better... Okay, so this is the original. I think let's keep that. Let's get another glass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll keep so that. We're going to do this, this, and that's the most essential thing when you're blending. You can't let the amount of glasses you have spoil your creativity. <laughs> so you must always have like a whole bunch in the background. Okay. So that's, this is the. Okay. So I'm going to go on your left, the fresher one. Okay. Cap Franc. Cap Franc. Cool. Got you. And then Petit Verdot. And then original blend. All right. All right. So let's, let's see where we start with the fresh. Hmm. Oh, that's lifted it, eh? I mean, if you looked at music, you would say a uh, lighter note. Heavier note. Yeah, that's definitely. you know, like. <laughs> so now it becomes a question of style. Yeah. Um, and vin and also being true to your vintage. And that's now. Um, hey, I did think, I do well? Exactly. <laughs> so I think you passing with the A there because that is the question. If you've got a a very expressive, very dense vintage, then we might want to express it in a certain way, even though the other one might be yeah. just as good or. Um, so that is kind of always the thing for us. If we're stuck in between two blends, we can't decide. We always go back to that very thing. First thing I mentioned, that little sticky note that you've got. Be true to your to the expression of that vintage. Yeah, it's amazing. You've now got the same blend. You've got 1% freshening it up, 1% making it more dense. 
and it's taken it it, does, it didn't take it one or two percent away from each other. It took it like that far apart from each other. Wow. So, big question. What do you prefer? So, look, I, I, I think it's interesting how my um, personal preferences have shifted more towards freshness over time. And so, if I were to take these two, I would choose the Cabernet Franc. Okay. We've got our blend. <laughs> Let's do this. Yeah. So, what do we do now? Light a briar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm 100% with you. I think here we were, for initial, I think, spitballing it. Yeah. That was a very good blend to start off with. It's yeah. not normally that you get that close in the first first intent. And I think literally that 1% of Cab Franc has taken it to the next level. Yeah. That's where I would like to express our yeah. Fusion 5. Yeah. It's, it's got all the components. It's got that red fruit. That plushness from the Merlot, the it's got the savouriness through. and the kind of the density and sweetness from the Malbec. It's got the Cab Franc lightening it up and just that 1% extra Cab Franc took it exactly the right direction. Whereas with the Mal Petit Verdot, yeah. and I think, if you now think about it again, that we talked about it briefly, like it can make or bring, it's just 1% more and yeah. it's now completely taken it to the dark side. It really <laughs> has, eh? Yeah, come back. <laughs> so... Uh, and Charles, what's interesting to me, I mean, you know, we're sitting here, we, we've, we've got uh, these five bottles, we've got these different uh, blending uh, percentages, but, but this is a, a ready, this one bottle is a blend of a blend of, a, it's a refinement from vineyard to barrel, selecting the barrel, going into barrel selection of those barrel selections all the way through to this sample. So what are the... <laughs> You know, what's the maths on, on something like this to okay. actually get to this level? So let's take it on a commercial level because like you say rightly, this is five samples. So yeah. this is from a specific barrel brand with a specific block that we've got with a specific clone in it. Um, so as I mentioned right in the beginning, we actually designed the vineyard. So that means looking at the soil types, looking at the planting material and the planting material, we're going to look at clones. So you're going to first of all have the varieties, the five varieties that we use. But then within that, you're going to have clones. And clones is like me and you. We're all humans. Um, but you're a little bit funnier than me. I'm, of course, a little bit smarter than you. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, you I can agree with that. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we're all humans, but we've all got that special trait. Yeah. And that's how you can kind of see varieties and clones. So within only our Cabernet Sauvignon, we've got five different clones. Um, four different rootstock combinations. Then you go to the Merlot and we've actually got around about eight different clones. Wow. You go to our Cap Franc, we've only got two or three clones there. Malbec, we've only got the one clone. There's one clone that just is head above the rest yes. from the other ones, but it's planted on three different sites. Mm. So that's all going to give you a little bit of a difference. The Petit Verdot is about four clones. Now you start making wine from it. So you mm. start making batches from that. So we'll get anything from around about 40 to 50 batches of wine. <laughs> um, that number there caps off A3, A4. That's, for instance, referring to one batch. Okay. But that one batch will be divided into barrels that we think will synergistically make the wine better. Yeah. So it will go into two or three coopers. The coopers will be split into different years. So you want first fill there, which could give you a lot of expression. Second fill, which is a little bit less. Third fill, that is really just playing a supporting role. Um, and then you've got toasting levels on top of that. So the blend that actually went into making the actual Fusion 5 2020, there would have been 176 what? bottles like this, all lined up. And then you would have had to put 2% of this, 3% of this, 5% of this, 1% of this into it um, to get into synergy. The concept stays the same. So find that sweet spot. Yeah. And then you start experimenting with what works and what doesn't work. Um, so on a commercial level, I would probably take this a little bit further. I think if we were to do it now, we would go a little bit too fresh. Um, for doing the amount of work to get to this blend, it was actually a <laughs> uh, oh, job well done. But that's also because you know the vineyards. You, you yeah, work exactly. with them for so long. It's, it's not something that happens by magic. It, it, it happens with the intimate knowledge of what you're working with and getting to know the personalities over a period of two years before mm -hmm. you actually get to this stage. Um, 
but yeah, it's a, it's an immensely satisfying job when you actually get to that final process and you know all the work and the heart and sweat and tears and beers yeah. that went into making yeah. it. And then you can unlock that and actually show it to your clients. Um, no, but you know, Charles, it's been such an amazing journey. First of all, working with you for so many years, but to understand this concept of blending, because I think, unfortunately, the African continent has been subjected over the years to the, the non-scientific approach to blending. You know, I mean, when we first started working in many of the, uh, the markets, uh, Africa was seen as, you know, uh, almost a place where you could send excess bulk wine, you know, as a market where you could push products with, without that level of care. But, you know, one of, one of the top markets for, for your wines that we work in is Botswana, Ghana. You know, these are markets, uh, Kenya, these are uh, countries where there's a huge affinity towards quality mm -hmm. um, and wine is becoming an amazing uh, subject matter and, and beverage of choice because of uh, the quality and, uh, and the story behind it. And you've really given us the behind the scenes today where uh, five different varietals can come together and become greater than the sum of their parts. Yeah. So, yeah, it's been an incredible uh, journey of understanding. And thank you so much for taking the time. So I've just got one question. Yes. Can you remember what went in here? Because we've got to make more now. So. <laughs> well, just a 1% of Cabernet Franc. <laughs> yeah, but thanks for... But we, can try, we can just try again. I think we'll go from the top. Um, yeah, thanks. And, and we exactly the same. We believe at Turin that uh, the African market is, is actually the one that it's closest to home. And it's yeah. the untapped market where we believe there's so much to share in that market. And we're hugely excited to be on that journey with yourself and under the influence because we do believe that that is probably the biggest unlocked market with the most excitement level for us as well um, to share our products with. Um, uh, we look so forward yeah, to you getting for, you for up, being on the journey with us. Yeah, we look forward to getting you up into the markets and you know there's some, one of one of our favorite places to to work in is uh, is in Kenya where we we even have a, a restaurant partner that's got uh, Wagyu beef that's being raised on the slopes of Mount Kenya, brought into his restaurant. You do a, a chef's table with eight people, paired with your wine. I mean, this is this is what the continent has to offer. It's extremely exciting, and yeah, and well done for being such a pioneer in terms of this next generation of of, of vineyard-driven blending, and then all the way into what we've just done today. It's it's extremely inspiring and uh, yeah here's to many more glasses together cheers thanks so much charles thank you cheers,